Let us begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to open your word. I pray that you would give us your Holy Spirit that we may understand. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Welcome, everyone. My name is Christian Giordano, and today we are going to cover the topic of the beginning of finding your calling. The beginning of finding your calling. Now, this is something that's been on my heart in my personal uh, journey that I've been studying, been desiring to understand, and I just want to share with you what I have found because I believe that it will help you as well. So let us begin. Let's begin with Mark chapter 2. We're going to see from the scriptures what the beginning of our calling is. Now, for those who don't know or may not be familiar with this language, a calling will mean what is your purpose? What did God put you on earth to do? Amen. And I think most people in the world, even if they don't identify as religious, they really want to know that. And the good news is that God wants you to know your calling and it can be found in the scriptures. So let us begin with our first scripture in Mark chapter 2 and verse 17. Mark chapter 2 and verse 17. And it reads, When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. And then right here, focusing on this, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Okay. So we see here, a call from sin to righteousness, from death to life. Now, this call is a universal call for all of mankind. Every man and every woman who's ever lived has had this same call. Now, I want to give a disclaimer before we go any further. This this study that we're doing I'm not going to get into the specifics of everything that every avenue of ministry that God is calling people to. But rather, we're dealing with the beginning steps to understand what does everyone have to be faithful in? What areas can everyone seek God in to where they can be led to know the specific calling upon their life? Amen? So we see here that the first step the first thing that everyone is called to is to come from sin to righteousness. This is the gospel. This is the power of Jesus in our lives. This is what is known as being born again. If you followed me or my brother in our ministry, you will find that we've shared upon this by God's grace and basically everything we've shared, whether it was Bible prophecy whether it was doctrine, we have always made an effort to put into the message the dire need that we must be born again. Because without this, nothing else matters. I've actually recently put out a whole series on the the steps by step of how to be born again. So You can look at my channel. It was a series originally by Margaret Davis. You can go through those videos and takes you point by point. But nevertheless, moving on, we see that this this process of coming from sin to righteousness is necessary in our calling. Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. That's the first call. Now, this first call has another name. Let's see that. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. This born-again experience has a name. Romans chapter 5. And it reads, Therefore, being justified by faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The born again experience is that peace. It is that we're no longer at war with God. We're now at peace with him because we've gone from sin to righteousness. And the Bible calls this experience justification or being justified. And as one of the great evangelists once said, justified is like, in other words, you could say, just as if I had not sinned. That's how God views you. He looks at you as if you had not sinned because you've come to him, you surrender your heart, you've confessed your known sins, and God forgives you. And now you believe him, you trust on his word, that he's, he means what he says, and now it is as if you've not sinned. You're clean before God. And now you're ready for the next step. And this step comes after justification. And we're going to find out what that's called. Let's go to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to find out more about how this is involved with understanding and finding your calling. 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 19. And it reads, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Does that sound familiar to what we just talked about with justification? It continues on to say, But in a great house... There are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these things, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Amen, brothers and sisters. This next step in salvation is the process, the experience of sanctification. You have justification and you have sanctification. Now, in this verse here, in verse 21, we get the, the definition of sanctification. It says that if a man being purged of these things, it, it mentioned vessels, it mentioned different things in a house, and it was using this as a, um, a simile or just an example to show that there's things that are good and things that are bad in us, but the bad things must leave. We must purge ourselves of these things. And when this happens, we can be a vessel unto honor, sanctified meat for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So sanctification means, the literal definition of sanctification is to be set apart for a holy use. Consecration is another word for sanctification. Set apart, consecrated, holy for God's use. Amen? And this is where God's use is our calling. This is where God wants to use us to reach the world. Amen? So, Continuing on, we, we are going to go to 1 Thessalonians, and we want to understand more of some areas of how God sanctifies us, what is involved, what areas of our life must we give to God in order to be sanctified which means to be ready for him to use us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. It says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, complete sanctification for us. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. 
So here we see that God desires to sanctify us, to set us apart in our spirit, our soul, and our body. And faithful is him who calls us. What does the spirit mean? The spirit in the Bible refers to our mind, our mental capacity. The soul is related to our spirituality. That's who we are. That's, that's our character. And the body is referring to our physical aspect of us. So if God is trying to sanctify us in these three areas, then that means that each of these areas, we have to have health. Health of the mind, health of the soul, and health of the body. So, with that in mind, let's look at a few areas that are covered by those, those three facets of man. So, this is in no way an exhaustive list. There's many other things, but these are some of the main areas that everyone is called to be faithful in. These are the foundational areas that God is calling everyone to. Amen? So, let's talk about Let's go, let's go to John, uh, John 17 and verse 17, and let's see this first area related to spiritual health. And frankly, it's related to all the other areas as well. It's related to physical and mental. But let's start John 17, verse 17. Okay, Jesus speaking. Jesus says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Brothers and sisters, part of sanctification, how it happens, is us reading and following the word of God. So, taking the word of God, the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, and reading it, and letting it, not just reading it, but being a doer of the word. As it says in the book of James, it says that we should not only be a hearer, but a doer. When we take it in and we say, we read something, we don't, you know, we come to the, to the word of God with an open heart, willing to let God do his work to us. Lord, refine me. Like you've ever seen a sculptor, they're chiseling away, they're hammering, they're you know, it might start out as a rude, um, plain block, but after the artist takes the time, very meticulous, lots of hard work, lots of hours, is chiseling away at the end. It's a beautiful sculpture, and that's what God desires to do to us. God wants to take a rough, a rough, um, a rough stone and make us into a diamond. And it's possible, brothers and sisters, it's very possible through the power of God and through taking heed to his word. This is an area that is so important, understanding that we must spend time in the word. Most people neglect this and it's foundational. If we don't spend time, then we're never going to have discernment. You know, there's many things we want to understand and they're right in the word. If they're in the Bible, they're in the spirit of prophecy. Brothers and sisters, if you understand, if you know what the conflict series is, if you know what the testimonies are, you need to read them. You need to understand these things. Your answers are there. And I just plead with you. I, I admonish you as someone who's done it myself and had many of their questions answered. And it's so beautiful the way Jesus has presented is to have a regular devotional life in the Bible and in the conflict, in the spirit of prophecy, in the Christ-centered books, in the testimonies, right? Please, brothers and sisters, it will help you so much. You'll understand the work. You'll understand what God is calling you to do. So we see that that is essential. A reading and studying and a, might I add, a prayerful reading and studying of the Word of God. So let's move on to some other areas. Let's talk about evangelism. Now, I'm not saying that 
I'm talking about the foundation. I'm not talking about everybody having to go and um, do some mighty work. I'm just talking about being faithful in how you work on your job, how you treat your family members in your home. Do we represent Jesus in the simplest ways? You know, a lot of times we think that we have to say something when, to be honest, usually the more effective uh, method is just how we act, especially around people you know uh, more well, like in your home or in your, or at your place of work. These people, they see you when you're in perplexing situations. They see you under pressure. And often it's, it's more how you deal with situations that's the real witness in those types of ways. So faithfulness in our home. Do we honor our father and mother? Do we, do we treat our siblings right? Do we treat our children right? Do we treat our spouses right? Husband and wives. This is a foundational aspect. So moving on, let's talk about physical health. Physical health, let's talk about being faithful in this way. There is so much common sense in how the body works with understanding, understanding truth, brothers and sisters. You see, our brain is an organ. And what we put in our body becomes blood. What we eat and drink becomes blood. And the brain runs off of blood. Our brain runs off of nutrients we get from what we eat. So what we think is affected by how we eat, how we take care of our body. So we have to exercise. We have to get fresh air and sunlight. We have to have proper nutrition. Let's look at a scripture real quick to show something about nutrition and its effect on how we work. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. You have Psalms, then you have Proverbs, then you have Ecclesiastes. So notice this, verse 17, Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 17. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat for strength and not for drunkenness. So that's talking about proper nutrition. And then it goes on to say in verse 18, By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of hands the house droppeth through. Brothers and sisters, what is a, a house a symbol of in the scriptures? 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 tells us that it's a symbol of the church. So, we see here in verse 17 that health precedes working in the church. Many individuals want to do a great work in ministry. People say, I want to work in ministry. Brothers and sisters, this is part of the beginning. You must understand health. You must take care of your body to be a fit vessel to be used by the Lord. Amen. Let's continue on. So another area is, is just basics of being a good steward with our time and our money, brothers and sisters. Time we can never get back. All we can do is be faithful now and into the future to try to redeem the time that we've lost in foolishness, Lord, in, in wasting. But if we are good stewards of our time, we can do much. We can do much more than we think we can. We can be much more time efficient. And this is something that's been on my heart to share with people is simple things about how to be a more effective worker. So if you would like to see some videos on things like time and priority management, what the, what the Bible has to say about that, leave a comment, uh, reach out and let me know. And this is some things that we can, I can start putting out to help benefit the workers. Amen. So being, being a steward with our money, we have to understand that to do 
the work of God, you have to have money, brothers and sisters. Not always a lot, but with many things you do need. You do need a good amount of money. Why? Because people tend to, um, they misunderstand the scripture. There's a scripture in the book of Timothy that says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And a lot of people get that wrong. They think money is the root of all evil. No, it says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money in and of itself is not evil, brothers and sisters. Money can be used as neutral. It can be used for bad. It can be used for good. If someone is faithful with their money, they can help a lot of people. They can open uh, churches. They can open businesses that help individuals. Whatever line of work there is that God has, it needs money. And God will bestow upon you more money if you're faithful in what you have now. Amen? Now, just these few things we looked at, let's, let's name them off again. Um, again, not exhaustive, but just some areas that everyone needs to be faithful in. We saw that in, in the area of reading, studying, prayer, evangelism, in the home, in, in the job, and also our health, our physical health, time and priority management and management of money. Now, all these, why are these so important? Why did we mention these? Well, let's go to Luke chapter 16 and verse 10. Luke chapter 16 and verse 10. Jesus speaking, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Brothers and sisters, the title of this message was The Beginning of of finding your calling. The reason why I titled it that is because many people want to know what is my life work? What has God called me to do? You know, the big picture. And the thing is, is if you're not being faithful in, in, what's, in what God has put in your way now, then you're never really going to find out the big picture. God's calling you to be faithful in the least. You know, people say, I want to work in ministry. Are you ministering now? You know, I want to be a preacher. I want to be an evangelist. Brothers and sisters, look, there's preaching is important. But look, the work's not going to be finished just by preachers. The work needs other lines. The work needs health food restaurants. It needs health food stores. It needs uh, businesses that minister to people's needs. It needs um, people that understand real estate. It needs many different things. And if we think that the work of God, the saving of souls, the proclamation of the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 are going to be uh, given and completed just through YouTube, brothers and sisters, we are, uh, we are deceived. That's not it. And you know what? I'll be honest. A lot of people that are preaching have no place preaching, brothers and sisters. They were never called to it. A calling produces fruit. What is the fruit of the ministries? A, a true ministry has the fruit of people being converted, people being changed from sin to righteousness, people actually having victory in their lives, not just becoming, uh, starting to learn doctrine and then treating people poorly and, and actually being worse than an unbeliever in many cases. Brothers and sisters, there's a lot of people, a lot of professed Christians, even a lot of professed SDAs who have no idea of how to, of how to talk to people. They, they, like Jesus said, about the uh, Pharisees, that you make a convert and he's, he's, he's worse, the child of hell, 
Now, that's strong words, brothers and sisters, but that's what Jesus said to a church member. Jesus said that to a church, someone high up in the church. And that's the case today. Everything that happened in Jesus' time is being repeated in our time. There are people who, yes, they preach about the mark of the beast and all this stuff. But brothers and sisters, they're not really converted. They're not really, they're not, they're not going into people's homes and actually praying with them and talking to them. Why? Because it's off camera. It doesn't get glory. It's not bringing attention. And you know what, brothers and sisters? The people that don't want to do that are really not burden bearers. That's what ministry is. Ministry is bearing the burdens of those that you're trying to save. So if you want to work in ministry, then start bearing the burdens of the people around you. Brothers and sisters, it's simpler than we think. You know what's one of the simplest things you can do to be a burden bearer? Start praying for the people that you know have problems. Come close to people. Talk to them about their life. You, it won't take very long. You'll start to see where the pain is. Minister to the pain. You see where the pain is, and like Jesus, the great physician, you apply the, the balm to where the pain is. You start to see, oh, this person is struggling in this part of their life, and you start praying for them. You start interceding for them daily. Every day you're praying for them. And brothers and sisters, you claim promises for them. And before you know it, you persist in prayer. You'll start seeing the prayers being answered. You'll start seeing people's lives be changed. Simple. You can do that, right? You can pray for somebody. You don't have to go to school for that. You don't have to have a degree for that. You can pray for them today. What else? Simple things we can do. Brothers and sisters, we can just help people. Sometimes it's just being there. We're so busy that we're like, oh, you know, I can't do that, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, you going out and somebody said they need a help. Oh, I need help moving. Um, I need, uh, you know, can you give me a ride? Um, whatever it may be, sometimes somebody just, you know, somebody just lost someone, you know, they just lost a loved one. They just need somebody to come help them to, to, to be around, to, to help them grieve. Simple things like this that we often overlook because we want to be, you know, I want to be in ministry. I want to be on camera. I want to do this. Brothers and sisters, that's the real ministry. The real, the, the real ministers are doing that stuff. They're going into people's homes. They're, they're dealing with the people personally. And that, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that all ministry online and stuff like that is wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm doing it too. But I'm doing it because I believe that, that what I'm sharing can help some people. And there are people. There is a place for this. There is a place for media ministry, for digital ministry. But that's not all, brothers and sisters. That's not total. That's not the total work. So, let's go to, in the, we're in the same chapter, Luke 16. Let's go to one more thing. Luke 16 and verse 12, related to what we said about being faithful in that which is least. It says, Luke chapter 16 and verse 12, And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? So, Here's something that has been, you know, I, I can attest to. You know, I, brothers and sisters, everything I'm sharing is something I've experienced. That's all I can share. And that's all you should share, brothers and sisters. Just share what you know. Ministry. Tell people what Jesus did for you. You know, look at when Jesus cast the demons out of that man. And uh, when, when the disciples and him went to that place, I can't pronounce it. It's like Ger Gergesenes or something. I, they went to that place, so they went on the boat, and they got out, and the man ran out. He was crazy. He broke the chains. And after he was, the, the demons were cast out of him, he said, Jesus, I want to come with you. I, you know, I want to join your, your evangelism team. And Jesus said, no, go back to your home and tell the people what God has done for you. That's what it is, brothers and sisters. One of the simplest forms of ministry. Just tell people what God has done for you. You know, I've knocked on doors before where um, individuals, you know, they might not 
want to hear what you have to say. You know, oh, I'm not, you know, I don't need it, blah, blah, blah. I don't believe in that. Well, brothers and sisters, nobody can take from you, you know, just, hey, this helped me. I just wanted to share it with you. Nope. What can somebody say to that? Is somebody going to be like, it didn't help you? Like, yes, it did. It helped me overcome whatever it may be. It helped me overcome depression, anxiety, fear, worry, whatever. Nobody can take that from you. And that's what the people, people, brothers and sisters, the world doesn't know who Jesus is. They've heard about Jesus, but they heard about a fake Jesus. They heard about a Jesus that doesn't give you victory over sin. The world often rejects the fake Jesus. They reject the real Jesus, not knowing that they think they're rejecting the fake Jesus. But we need to show people the real Jesus. And I'm sorry, I'm getting off my point a little bit, but this, this idea of being faithful in the least, it says here that if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? I want you to think about something. I, like I was saying, getting back to my point, I'm not sharing with you anything that I haven't experienced. And I have a full-time job. I, um, I work in ministry when I can and how I can. Why? Because I believe that I want, I want people to know what God can do, that He can help them. Now, sometimes you may be working and you're like, man, you know, I wish I was doing something more for God. You know, I wish I don't want to be doing this. You know, um, I believe in health. You know, I love health. And sometimes in my job, I'm, I'm dealing with things that I'm like, man, this isn't good for people. This is unhealthy. I'm selling people this stuff, you know, and it's like, but then you realize that if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Brothers and sisters, be encouraged. Be faithful where you are. Be faithful in your job. Be faithful in whatever. And God will take you higher. Maybe God will use you to start a business. You know, whatever line it could be. And if you're faithful in, in someone else's business, maybe you're an employee at someone else's business now, if you're faithful, God may give you your own business. And then, and then it can be ran in a better way, a way according to the scriptures. So, God desires to do this for us, brothers and sisters. And I just want to close on this note. Don't worry so much about the future and, you know, figuring out every detail of what's the big work. Just be faithful now. Be faithful in what's around you and, and keep close to God. Draw nigh to Him in prayer. Be, be um, open to see God's work of providence. Study providence. Study how God has worked in your life and see opportunities will come, brothers and sisters, and we need to be able to discern when God is opening doors for us. It's not always going to be the right way. Sometimes we have to see, ah, you know what, that wouldn't be the right thing. But through prayer, through staying close to God, through staying in His Word, we'll be able to tell where God is leading and we'll be able to know where the next step is, where God's leading us to where we will know our, our life work, where we'll know the calling, the specific calling God has called upon us. And brothers and sisters, it all starts with having that rest. If you haven't found that rest, the justification, even before the sanctification, brothers and sisters, you can have it today. Let's turn to one, one more scripture. I know, I know, I said I was ending, but brothers and sisters, this is important. Because a lot of people are trying to, a lot of people are trying to work for God. You know, they're trying to work in ministry but they're being bogged down by care and worry and stress and anxiety. And they need rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. It says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, 
For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Brothers and sisters, God wants you to enter into this rest. There's a book called Steps to Christ. It's one of my favorite books, probably my favorite book after the Bible. And it says in that book, a very powerful line, it says, The heart that rests most fully upon Christ will be most earnest and active in labor for him. That's page 71 of the book Steps to Christ. The heart that, met, that rests most fully on Christ, trusting in him, not worrying about all these things, but just resting in his love, resting in, in that he, he can keep you from falling. Those that do that, that, have, that find that rest, they'll be the most earnest and active in labor for him. And one more scripture. Romans chapter 8 and 28. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Brothers and sisters, learn to rest. Learn to take the scripture and understand that if you surrender to God, things will come. Things will happen. Your, your day is not going to always go how you planned. Things are going to come up. Disappointments are going to happen. There's going to be disruptions. But learning how to rest in that, learning how to understand, Lord, you're in control. It says that those who do that, it says that they're the called according to his purpose. This is my prayer for you, and stay tuned, brothers and sisters. This channel will be putting out more content to help you in your calling. And I am a, um, like I said, I have a full-time job, and I have other areas of ministry that I work in outside of digital media. But by God's grace, it's not going to be every week, but um periodically we I will be posting. And my brother also is posting. I will share the link to his channel in the description. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the clarity that your word gives. Lord, thank you that many of us have wanted direction in our life, Lord. You know, we want to know the meaning of life. Why, Lord? What, why are we here? Well, Lord, the meaning is to be saved and to lead others to be saved. And Lord, thank you that you will show us the specific area for us. Lord, help us to be faithful in that which is least, that we may go higher and higher, Lord, to higher ground to understand where you've called us specifically. Lord, please be with those who are listening. Bless them, strengthen them, and encourage them. All this we ask, and for the forgiveness of sins, in Jesus' name, amen.